Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mutual Knowledge. Today, you don't have one but two hosts of the show. I am Gautier Lamotte, and we have also Zoe Bretterman. And today, our guest is Honey Greenwall, CEO and founder of Olympics. Hi, Honey, and hi, Zoe. Hi. All right. So, Honey, can you please uh, introduce yourself and tell us how you came in contact with the blockchain industry? Yeah, sure. So hi, I'm Connie, founder of Olympics. Um, we started just about two years ago, but my track record with blockchain started in 2017, similar timing to when I got into security. So my first security internship was with the team that shut down the Silk Road, XFBI. Wow. And they worked at a, yeah. So it's really interesting when you work in the government, usually what you'll do is you'll work there a couple of years, build up your reputation, you know, close some great cases like they did. And then you'll move to a consulting firm and then you'll subcontract to the government and, you know, triple, quadruple your rate. So that was kind of the play they were going for very common in industry. And it was the summer that I was doing my undergrad in computer science. And after that summer, I started my master's in security engineering. Um, we were doing everything from, you know, fraud investigation in a major financial institution where it's writing algorithms to find human error in um, and like detect any instances of fraud in like large scale accounts, financial accounts to um, drug investigations in the tri state area where we're doing threat utilizing forensic technology um, to find information about the source dealer. So that's the summer I was like, mm, fun to build, more fun to break. Like I want to stay in security. Um, so I stayed in security. Since they had that background with the Silk Road, I'd started buying crypto in 2017, but nothing more than that. Um, fast forward, I had uh, taken my career. I'd done some uh, software engineering, some security engineering at JP Morgan, and then I moved to a late stage startup security scorecard after they raised their E. And I was lucky enough to be hired under one of the founders. Um, and on the side, I launched an NFT project for fun. A lot of really smart people I knew were moving. And um, I'll fix that. Smart technical people I knew were moving full time into the Web3 ecosystem. And I just want to understand it more, um, more than just putting some money in. I wanted to touch it. I wanted to build within it. So I was working on this at night, like a 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. gig. And I realized how large the attack surface was in this ecosystem, specifically pertaining to smart contracts. So three things in particular really stood out to me. One was the immutable nature of code. Two was the transparent nature. So being able to extract everything at a byte or source code level. And three was direct access liquidity. So being able to, instead of you know web two where you get hacked and your data gets stolen, it's web three, you get hacked and your entire company goes down because they can pull all of liquidity out of it. So it was just like a crazy novel attack surface. And I was like, wow, there must be the coolest tech thing built here. Like there's so much money here um, in the space. So many people are building the space, the tech must be insane. So I was just like trying to nerd out on it. Like I just wanted to see what people were building. Um, historically, you know, you see a similar attack surface in medical device security or aerodynamic security where the testing has to be very rigorous pre-deployment. Um, so I thought like maybe we'd see um, a notch up for that from that and turns out there wasn't. The whole industry was pretty much reliant on manual services, um, i.e. audits. So their team wouldn't have any tools to help them, you know, be secure proactively. They just rely on the third party audit coming um, and implementing, you know, code review and giving some, you know, and they're great audit firms, but at the same time, it's not foolproof. 90% of exploit contracts were audited. So it seemed kind of broken to me. And like, in order to scale this ecosystem, the thesis was developers would need better tools and the security would need to shift left. People would need to begin to understand the quality of your work is the quality of your code. And they need to learn how to write really high quality code um, and know how to find bugs, know how to spot bugs. And in order to do that, they need good tools. So um, that's kind of the evolution of how I ended up starting Olympics and building it. And, I guess maybe it makes sense in a little to get into kind of what we do. Um, makes sense now or later? No, no. no. Okay, sure. So um, we build the developer tools. So that's kind of our mission, just build the best developer security tools on market that enable developers to build more secure, faster. Um, and so we are kind of core product and our free product that was kind of our first domino that we want to prove is like, hey, if we actually built these incredible tools, that helps them on security from the start, would would they use them and implement them? And would they become better developers? Turns out the answer is yes. 
20% of Solidity developers now use our static analyzer, which is a free tool. Um, and then we additionally have other tools, which are, you know, paid additional products like automated unit testing, mutation testing, stuff like that. So um, it goes a little bit more expansive than that, but our free tool static analysis um, has a lot of usage and market dominance. That's wonderful. And are there other solutions that inspired you in the, that, that are doing the same thing? Or did you guys invent all these tools because... Uh, the market was really lacking something is it because other solutions were incomplete or is it because of a specific philosophical standpoint thing saying okay there are all other good solutions but nothing like our approach sure so um in web like static analysis is known tried and true um in web 2 as well um so in web 3 there were some open source static analysis tools but the adoption is very low people often hated them they were like hard to read, false positive rate was crazy. Um, the quality of the detectors was lower. So there definitely were static analysis tools in market, um, but not with high adoption. Like everyone I spoke to was like, I know I should use it. However, it's so annoying to use, like the results are too clingy that I don't. So there weren't tools that had, you know, mass adoption and loyalty. Whereas what we've built does, because not only is the quality really good, um, of the data, but also just the front end and user experience is seamless. Yeah, we actually, um, we have an, a, a great UX expert on board, Rebecca, who also sees that a lot of, a lot of, you know, um, blockchain products have poor UIs and that that needs to change in order for adoption to happen. And you know, specifically when it comes to security, you want the better tool because you need to do a better job because so much depends on that. Right. Uh, it reminds me, uh, 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 you know, the, the comfort of the UI is actually something that makes, that improves safety because if, if it's painful to use, you will eventually find an exception saying, okay, I'm not going to use my safety procedure this time because it's so painful that, okay, this time, just this time I'm making an exception because I'm too tired or too, it, it's too much of a hassle to use it for such a small risk and this is how you uh, you commit uh, errors so yeah. right yeah. it's way too easy to fall into that trap so like all the more important to, to, to um amp up the education and um the quality of the tools and ease to use it's just it's, it's a real deal breaker um great yeah so so static code analysis you know going with your free tool it uses ai to secure software could you explain at a high level how Olympics does that such that a non-technical audience will be able to understand? Yeah. So static analysis, um, for the most part, is deterministic, meaning it's like rule-based. So if I see X occur in the code, um, I will know it means Y, right? So you're just looking for patterns. Um, the problem with that is you often run into a high false positive rate. So we just have a layer of AI on top. So we patented our own model that optimizes um, to lower the false positive rates. But it, it does classic static analysis. We built our own compiler. We built everything in house. It took over a year, blood, sweat, and tears to get our static analyzer to place it as now. And the detectors are really high quality. And then the AI just optimizes to make sure we don't have too much noise. Because um, if you're going to have too many results, the even if you have you know, five incredible results, if there are 100, there's no way they're going to get to those five. And it really doesn't matter. It's important that maybe you have, you know, seven, eight, so they can ignore three and five mean something to them. So that's really important um, metric we look at is our false positive rate. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, allow me to, to ask a question. What, um, how is it different technically from, say, formal verification, for example? Great question. So um, formal verification is dynamic. Um, think of static analysis as something you can just run while you're writing code. Uh, at least ours is live um, and in real time. Formal verification requires a lot more work. Um, so take Sertora, for example, which is an incredible company built by incredible engineers, incredible teachers. Yeah, Muli sort um, of. They're a formal verification Web3 company, and you can't underscore how smart those people are. However, the developer experience is very difficult. So... Um, formal verification is going to lead you to higher quality results, but you're asking the developer to do two things. One, learn a second language. So they have to learn the language. 
um, and then to write the right specs. So they have to write the right specs to ask the questions of the code to infer the logic. Um, so it's a lot more work. Um, and it's work that developers don't do. So static analysis, you can't compare to formal verification because there are different levels. Like you'd need to do both. Um, but formal verification today and the way it exists isn't widely adopted. Um, and it's a problem. And so um, kind of making it easier is something on our roadmap, easier to use, easier to understand. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. So important, yeah. So important. And um, please share any DevSecOps related advice you may have for blockchain developers. I would say, and I think this is, yeah, what I put down, just understanding the importance, and I touched on this a bit earlier, but that in this new attack system and in this ecosystem where you have so much responsibility and the power to put money in people's hands internationally to create entirely new economic infrastructure globally. It's incredible, but also with great power comes great responsibility and you cannot treat it like web two code. You know, Mark Zuckerberg famously was quoted for saying move quick and break things because if you're building a web two application. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Like if, a uh, you know, random user reports a bug on Netflix, great you can fix it quickly it's not going to affect anything if there's a bug in your smart contract code especially if it's a protocol and pertaining a lot of liquidity your company can go down and innocent people's money who believed in this who trust in this is gone people's savings where they don't trust their governments they entrusted in like this you know foreign entity um global entity to put their money and trade their money through one of your protocols and you weren't responsible enough to own security from the start to implement these proactive tools oh. so understanding the importance of owning security and the responsibility you have in this ecosystem and building is so critical, meaning it is your responsibility to learn what you need to do, static analysis, dynamic analysis, audit, internal code reviews, 100% branch and line coverage, mutation testing, all these pieces that historically in you know, a web two organization, you wouldn't really have to worry about that much until you get to a certain size. Even if you're an eight person company, you take like Frax Finance, eight people, 870 million in volume. You have a lot of freaking money that you're responsible for. It's not a joke. You need to take security seriously. So like, that's just an example of a small organization. I have no idea how they treat their security. I'm sure they're great. Um, but I'm just trying to highlight the scale of like eight people are responsible for so much money, right? That's just a crazy statistic. And on top of that, they're also responsible for the security and safekeeping of that money. And so the level of responsibility goes exponentially up um, with the level of impact that you can have. I have two questions about that. Mm -hmm. um, one regarding uh, Web three. I, I assume it doesn't help. There, it doesn't help at all to secure the code when everything is mostly open source and people have all the latitude to try to break it. Or, or, or is it helpful to have the the open source code because you can benefit from um, emulation from the others? So everything's extractable at like a source or byte code level. So. I don't know how much it like really matters, oh. um, but it's important that you don't have holes in your system, right? So like it's important that regardless how you choose to push your code, um, that the proper security and proactive steps are put into place. And I'm and sorry, I want to just comment on that. It's not just proactive security. That's like also responsible, but also reactive, like implementing a monitoring solution. So stuff that we don't even do, but like, you know, making sure to get audit and implement monitoring solutions, other pieces of the puzzle. Like the stack does not begin or end with one thing. It's a security stack um, and it's robust. So there's like, you know, three or four solutions you're going to need to put your credit card down for. Kind of sucks, but you need it. You can't afford to not have it. Huh. Right, always, yeah. So true, so undeniably true. <laughs> so, um, if you could just talk about one type of smart contract vulnerability and explains why it concerns you and how to mitigate it. Yeah, so you sent me this question before. I think a good one to touch on is just a statically detectable one because so often Solidity developers, like there's very few Solidity developers that are over one, one and a half years of experience. So a lot of these vulnerabilities that show up via statically detectable design patterns, such as reentrancy, are kind of a big deal and something you want to learn about. And again, you can use our free tool to do that because as you're writing code, it's going to pick up if you um, 
have that kind of bone in your or bone in your uh, contract. Mm -hmm. And so having awareness of kind of what are these patterns that I'm writing look like, where can an attack factor be introduced? You often after you make the mistake a couple of times, you won't make it more than that. Um, a reentrancy vulnerability is a state change after an external call. A way to like high level think about it is, let's say you're a bank and um, you, Zoe, put $1,000 into the bank, but the bank only updates the system at the end of the day at six. So you come in the next day and you're like, I want to withdraw, you know, at 10 a.m., 1,000. Then I want to withdraw 1,000 at 11 a.m., 12, you know, you're going to overdraw. So the same idea and you can go all the way until you empty the bank. And that can be a huge problem for the system, you know, the whole contract can be drained. Um, and historically, it's been a huge problem. Obviously, now it's statically detectable. So it's not usually happening in contracts, but something that newer slate developers need to learn how to watch out for and not embed into their code. Because oftentimes what happens is like they'll find it, but they need to learn. They'll find it pre-audit during code review, but something that, you know, they eventually need to learn to not even implement, right? They need to learn not to make that mistake and learn the best practices. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the reentrance attack is, yeah, really scary when you, and um, just translating to what it, what it means in, in the real world as you, as you've um, just done is just verifies that. Um, so talk about like the, you know, developer education and, um, you know, that eventually the goal is to get developers to not make these mistakes um, from the start shifting left. And mm -hmm. so how, how can we as security professionals educate non-technical audiences about blockchain security? Yeah, um, non-technical audience in the ecosystem or not in the ecosystem? Um, in, in the ecosystem. Yeah, okay, so I would say, and we talked about this a bit, Zoe, but it is really hard. So proactive security and security in general, and even let's zoom out again, like security doesn't matter until it does. Even in traditional web two, like 2008, CISOs weren't even really a thing. Fast forward 2023, security budgets higher than ever. You know, 2008 security market was like 3 billion. 2020, 2022, over 300 billion, right? So it doesn't matter until it does, is, is the key thing with security. And again, zoom out and don't even think about what to think about just I built a house okay in the middle of nowhere I don't need security then all of a sudden there's a couple houses all of a sudden I put an alarm system then we get a couple more we put a police station then we have a country we put FBI CIA security doesn't matter until it does so we are at that pivotal point in the web three ecosystem where innovation and then something else I'll just touch on just like innovation always precedes security so innovation has happened and there's so much money in the space and security and like risk is catching up North Korea and historical you know, Lazarus Group, who has historically, an AP2 group who has historically operated in the Web2 sector, has moved primarily to Web3. And North Korea is funding the nuclear program with money from Web3 exploits. Like, the stakes are very high now, and people know how easy it is to exploit. So I think the best way you educate is you, you kind of take people through this journey. And as unfortunate as it is, you let them feel the fear because the fear is real. It's not like a fake fire. It's a real fire. And if you don't put it out and you don't proactively you know, maintain it and, and control it, it's going to go out of control and this ecosystem not only won't scale, but could be completely taken down. So implementing security infrastructure is of the utmost importance. In fact, like we can't move forward without it. So over the last two years, we've seen a spin up of many cool security companies. Um, not forget Olympic, Olympics is amazing. It's my company, but like there's so many other amazing entrepreneurs doing really cool things, unique um, bug bounty contests, um, economic risk modeling, um, monitoring solutions, insurance solutions, like the stack is beginning to form. And if you were to, you know, backtrack three years ago, there was pretty much no security stack, pretty much just audits. Um, and now all the tools and infrastructure are slowly starting to come into place, which is a beautiful thing to see because my prediction is in the next five years, the ecosystem will just skyrocket with the right infrastructure um, that's being built in place now. And a lot of people built these you know, they believe in it so much that FTX was collapsing as many of us were starting to build these companies. Um, and regardless of the sentiment around the ecosystem, we knew how critical this was. Um, and we built it and then the bull market came and then all these solutions were kind of ready. So the ecosystem now has that comfort of like so many infrastructure solutions and so many more that I'm sure are going to spin out over the next, you know, couple of years as well. 
Well said, well said. Yeah, I mean, I always find it effective to, well, depending on who the audience is. Um, so if it's developers, uh, show them something being exploited um, with a certain exploit. And again, not Web3 specific. We have a newsletter, actually, that covers every two weeks I put it out. And I've never had less than like five exploits to cover, which is scary. Scary and good that you're being proactive on that because, you know, right. you, you, you need to see it. You're right. You're right. They don't care until, until something happens. And right. whatever level that is, if it's like a more high level non-devs, then, you know, it's going to be maybe a news item. See, all this money lost. But right. um, I mean, yeah, like we got health insurance, right? Like no one ever got hurt. No one get health insurance. If just some people got like, you know, some scrapes and cuts and whatever. But people get hurt so much and you see it all around you and you see how helpful it is like you wouldn't even think twice before buying it yeah yeah true always just you know everything by example and that just i mean that's how open source or you know works really everything's just kind of by example building um building upon itself and all having that mostly useful and productive types of transparency, which is super important um, for education. Cause all, you know, it's, it's all contextual. It's not about, you know, some sort of theory or because I said so. And sometimes we just kind of need to remind people of that depending on, you know, various stakeholder groups. You just have to remind them that they, they need to see it harshly sometimes, but you know, harshly, but not actually costing them something um some demo some example and yeah i'm 100 with you on that one it's a great point that's wonderful and uh i'd like to ask one question uh, because you um i like it when i have people who have expertise in both fields ai and the blockchain and uh for some people, it basically goes as well as peanut butter and chocolate together. And for some other people, it goes as well as a barbecue sauce and peanut butter, which is very different and not, not as good and tasty. So I'd like to know your take. Uh, how do you think in the future these two, uh, these two fields can help um, ensure a high level of safety in, in the field? Because some people are, are uh, saying that Basically, AI is going to lower uh, to, because of the statistical compromise is going to reduce the safety of the blockchain. And some other people are going to say the opposite. So I'd like to hear your take about that. Yeah. So it's funny. Olympics was always Olympics AI, mm -hmm. pre-GPT and OpenAI blowing up. So when we started, you know, FTX was collapsing. OpenAI wasn't a thing. So people hearing Web3 security AI company, it was not like... Now it sounds cool. Now it sounds like buzzwords, given where we are today. But two years ago, it did not. Um, so I was always bullish on the intersection of AI and Web3 security. And the reason being is because so much of the manual processes today can be automated. And not 100%. You definitely need the auditors. Like that third-party human review is always going to be critical. But a lot of these you know, protocols are getting two, three audits. I think there's a way to automate, you know, 50, 60% of what auditors are doing right now and make it so you only need to pay for one. And then the barrier to entry becomes, you know, lower for the ecosystem. So now instead of paying, you know, a couple hundred K for audits, you're going to spend 50 K. Okay. Maybe then eventually becomes 10 K. And, and as, as you chip that down, more people are able to build in the space. Um, and humans being trained and knowing how to audit is, very hard to scale at quality. Machines learning how to do things is easier, a lot easier. Um, and then having that human head to oversee and to look for other novel vulns, which is something that a machine isn't going to be, you know, that great at finding. But anything that's happened historically, any like known attack vectors, attack patterns, machines can learn that and they can try and replicate it. And there's so many interesting use cases with AI and how we can play that out. Um, our different tools use AI so differently across the board. So there's not like one way that AI is used. There's different types of learning that we practice um, internally. Um, there's, you know, agent, we, we have so much going on. And um, a lot of things also around it, as I say, it's not just the AI, it's the systems that complement the AI. So what's guiding the AI and how is it telling it what to do? Um, that's so critical. And then as well as kind of the information and training data that your AI has. Um, so for us, it's very specific to the niche sector we work on. 
Um, yeah, but I'm I'm really bullish on it. Um, I think there will be a day where so much of what today's manual becomes automated and so many more people are able to join and build in the space because of that. And that will be a really beautiful thing. Thank you know, you we're sure. here in America where we have this luxury of trusting our government, trusting our money. We don't even know what it's like to live somewhere like Venezuela or Brazil where you don't trust your government, um, you know, to secure your money. And like being able to secure the future of um, the crypto ecosystem as a whole and making it possible for people internationally to hold, store and have autonomy over their money is just next level um, in terms of what, like rewarding. Like that's an incredible thing. Well said. Yeah. I mean, it definitely keeps, it definitely keeps us going. Um, one of the major things, just how much we're building, how much we're changing, just the opportunity for impact. We are, we are lucky. Yeah. We got to share it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much about that. Zoe, do you have another question to ask? Well, that was it for me. Super informative. And um, I'm super excited to continue to you know, play with and explore and use the tools, the tools as well. Because um, again, so needed, so promising and really great to have you. Thank you so much for having me. It was so nice. Thank and you, thanks everyone. For Dear listeners, this was Mutual Knowledge. And our guest today was Honey Greenwell. Look her up. She's the CEO and founder of Olympics or Olympics AI, depending on, on the year. Thank you so much, Hani. That was a blast. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Thank you, so much. you too.